next speaker uh, is Irene Lowe. She's going to talk over information acquisition and management. Thanks to Kiel and Liat for inviting me to talk in this workshop, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we're excited to talk about this work with all of you. This is joint work with Nicola Morica, who's right here, uh, Jacob Leshno, who is also right here behind Nicole, uh, and Brendan Lucier, who is not here, uh, but he's at Microsoft Research in New England. Our starting point today is going to be the standard college admissions of many to one matching model. So in this model, we have uh, students who have preferences over colleges, and they can each be assigned to just one college. Colleges also have priorities over students, and then they have a quota for the number of students that can be assigned to the college. And the market outcome in this setting is just a matching of students to colleges. For each student, we assign them to a college, making sure that we don't violate the quotas. In the setting, a common solution concept is stable matching. In a stable matching, no student college pair can do better by matching to each other instead of to their uh, uh, sort of proposed matches here. And so if we want to get to a stable matching, then well, what should the market look like? Or what should the clearinghouse look like? We should use something called deferred acceptance. And typically how this is implemented is we have some central clearinghouse. Everyone reports their full preferences to the clearinghouse, and then we take these preferences as input into this black box deferred acceptance algorithm, and we output the final assignment of students to colleges. Okay, so this is what's typically done, but the question we're going to think about today is, what if people don't know their own preferences? Okay, then, then what are they going to report to us? And how, how can we reach some kind of good, maybe stable outcome when people don't know where they want to go? In particular, maybe people don't know their preferences and it's costly for them to learn their preferences. So for example, in college admissions or school choice, maybe there's some sort of cognitive effort. You have to look up the different colleges and sort of decide what you want and which of the colleges fit those. Maybe there's actually a, a monetary cost or time. You have to go and physically visit these colleges. Uh, in hospital residency matching, uh, similarly, medical students have to pay out of pocket to go and visit these prospective hospital placements. And so that can cost them up to thousands of dollars uh, when they're going through this process. Okay, and so if people don't know their preferences and it's costly for them to learn their preferences, then maybe there's a way we can use the marketplace to help guide them in acquiring their preferences. And so what we're going to do today is look at the marketplace as both a place that determines the final assignment of agents to objects, but also facilitates the acquisition and transfer information between all the different participants in the market. And with this in mind, we're going to ask the following questions. How do existing matching mechanisms affect student information acquisition? And can we design clearinghouses that facilitate efficient information acquisition for all students? And I'm going to be a little more uh, precise later about what I mean by efficiency. Okay. So this is where I'm going. First, I'm going to set up a model and solution concept uh, for this matching with incomplete information. So in my model, my market outcome is going to consist of both a matching as well as how much information has been acquired, so an information state. And then stability has to be defined with respect to this information. And in particular, the information acquisition is going to be endogenous to sort of uh, the, the state that we're in. On top of this, I'm also going to define a notion of optimal information acquisition. And I'm going to put all of this, the stability with optimal information acquisition, into the solution concept that I call regret-free stability. After I set up the model and this solution concept, then I can start asking, well, how can we reach such a solution concept? How do standard matching mechanisms perform? Uh, if they perform poorly, what can we do better? And so I'm going to show, indeed, they can perform poorly. Um, standard mechanisms can get stuck in these, what we call, information deadlocks. The idea is that in a matching market, if I don't know my preferences, well, how I acquire my preferences depends on what's available to me, which depends on your preferences. But how you acquire your preferences depends on my preferences. Okay, so we have these kind of circular dependencies where everyone's optimal information acquisition process depends on everyone else's. And so it's very easy to construct instances where you just get stuck. In order for anyone to do an optimal thing, they, they, they want to wait for more information. They want to wait for someone else to act first. 
And so what we say is, well, this, this is a problem that we can't get around just by cleverly designing mechanisms. What we do is we, we need more information to be injected into the market at the beginning to sort of jumpstart this learning process. So what we say is, well, first of all, let's characterize what these regret-free stable outcomes look like. Uh, we show they exist, and there's a sufficient statistic for characterizing them in, in terms of these admissions cutoffs. Uh, and then, so what we need to know then in the market is just what are these admissions cutoffs? And we provide some ways for estimating these cutoffs, maybe using historical data and showing some results that show that we can uh, bootstrap this information to reach an approximately optimal outcome. Okay, so this is where we're going. Uh, there's a lot of related literature on information acquisition in market design, uh, as well as notions of stability in matching markets with incomplete information. Uh, a lot, another related strand is sort of the communication complexity of matching markets. Uh, what our solution concept is trying to do is we define a notion of st stability in these incomplete information settings, and then we want to minimize the cost in some sense of getting to the stable outcome. And so that's quite related to communication complexity, uh, minimizing the complexity of communicating information is kind of similar to minimizing the cost of acquiring information. And on top of that, we're going to be using a particular model for costly information acquisition. This is based on the weitzman pandorus box model, uh, but there are a number of different related models. You could sort of think about what happens if you take these models and embed them in the matching setting. Okay. Let me introduce you to our model. We're in a many-to-one matching setting where we have a finite set of colleges. Uh, college I has a quota QI for the number of students that it can admit. And then we have a continuum of students, and we have a distribution over these students. I'm going to describe these students in just a moment. In our model, we have just one-sided incomplete information. So the college priorities are known. Okay, college priorities are public, and they're encoded here by this RSI. Uh, I've been told that R should stand for reverse rank, because if you have higher rank, higher reverse rank, then you are preferred. So over here, student one has higher reverse rank at college I than student two, and therefore he is I don't know. So, so, someone says that ranks, smaller ranks are better. Okay, but here the larger ones are better. Uh, and so, okay, again, colleges have these publicly known priorities where a larger priority is better, and students have incomplete information over their preferences. We specify what a student does know. Here's a student. Her name is S. She has a value VSI for attending college I. Okay. So this is a cardinal value that she obtains for, attain uh, for attending this college but uh, she doesn't know this value. What she does know is she has a prior F over the distribution of her value, and she has one of these for every single college, and her values for the colleges are independently uh, drawn from these priors. What she can do to learn her value is she can go and visit or pay this cost, CSI, for learning exactly her value at college I. So again, the student starts off uh, with initial information. She knows her prior, she knows her costs, and she knows her rankings relative to everyone else in the market. And that's all she knows. And so if we were in a single agent model, some of you might recognize this as just the uh, Weitzman Pandora's box model for consumer search. Right? Each of the colleges is a box, and the student can pay uh, the cost to learn her value exactly at a particular point. So now we have all these pieces, and an economy is just given by the set of colleges, their quotas, uh, the set of all possible student types, and a distribution over this set of student types. And this also implies a distribution over the, the, these sort of initial student types, what students know about their information to begin with. And an outcome in our model consists of two parts. There's the matching, which is just an assignment of students to colleges. But on top of that, we need to keep track of how much information has been acquired in this market. And so we encode that here by these uh, inspection indicators. So chi SI 
is telling me uh, it's one if and only if student S has inspected college I and otherwise it's zero. So I'm just, because the only information acquisition that students can do is inspect colleges, I'm just keeping track of which colleges they've inspected. Yes, yes. So you should think of this as a model of the continuum of students. And and uh, yeah, that, I'll get to the assumptions in just one slide. Um, on top of that, one last piece of notation. I'm going to take this bold curly S. You should think of this just as uh, giving me the space of all interim student types. So as students are acquiring information about their values, uh, they sort of know more than they initially did. So they know more than theta. But they still don't know their full vector of values. Okay, so this is just the, if you're somewhere in between. If I've inspected college one, now I know my value at college one, and I still only know my priors at all the other colleges. And uh, so this is my actual values. These are the colleges I've inspected, I'm just taking an equivalence between uh, sort of these student types, which are indistinguishable given these inspections. Okay, but all you need to remember is that there's an S, which is a student type, including their values. There's a theta, which is the initial type, and then I bold for the interim type notation. Okay, so here are our assumptions. The assumptions we make are that students must inspect a college in order to be a uh, match to that college or assigned to that college. Uh, we make this assumption for a number of reasons. One of the main ones is just for tractability. If we were to do the single agent, uh, if we're looking at just the single agent problem and we wanted to let students take boxes or attend colleges without inspecting them, then we end up with this uh, Pandora's box with non-obligatory inspection. Uh, Laura Delval has a paper on this which basically says that the optimal policy is really complicated even for, an, for one student and two boxes. So for tractability and so we can get some nice closed form solutions, we're, we're going to assume that you have to inspect. On top of that, we also assume that students have strict preferences. Uh, this is just to make sort of notation and things easier. And when I say things about uniqueness, it, that's using strict preferences. And if they're not strict, we're just going to break ties in some fixed way. Uh, and on top of that, we are assuming that this is a continuum economy. In particular, students are going to be non-atomic. And on top of that, uh, we have something that we call this consistency condition. But you should think of this as meaning there's no aggregate uncertainty about aggregate demand. Okay? So if I look at, well, about aggregate values. So if I look at all the students who have this initial type theta, associated with that is a prior over their values at all the different colleges. And if I look at the actual values of this set of students, that distribution is exactly equal to F theta. Yes? Uh, so in, in, in line with that first assumption that college students must inspect the college, does that mean that the prior beliefs have to have uh, the same support? Like you couldn't have a prior belief for value that's note, like with probability one less than the value for a different college? Because then yeah. you would already know the, the relative ranking. Um, well, you could still have Let's, let's say we had this instance where the, the support for one dominates the support for two, then you would just not be assigned to two and you would not inspect it. I think it's fine. Without having to inspect it. Yes, so you only have to inspect the one that you're assigned to. You're, not, you're never going to choose two. If, if one is available to you, so you'll never inspect it. Okay. Um, Thinking of value and cost being on the same scale. So the value for a college and the cost you pay to inspect it is. Yes. Yeah. So I am thinking uh, of a setting where your cost could perceivably change whether or not you choose to inspect. Uh, let me get to the single agent model, and I think it will become clearer. So you require for each theta that your empirical distribution coincides with uh, Yes. So you have not many values for theta because it's a very strong assumption. So for each theta, you have a continuum, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you can think of it as, you know, there's some, there's some finite number of thetas, yes. and we have a uh, finite number of types, theta, and we have a mass of students. 
sort them out over the priorities uh, as appropriate. More questions about the model? Okay, great. So let me get to the single agent problem. As I mentioned before, you can think of the single agent problem just as the Weitzman Pandora's box problem. So what is that problem? Initially, the student beta knows that her value for college i is distributed according this, to this prior f. And so what she can do is she can dynamically or adaptively uh, choose to pay her inspection costs to inspect school colleges. And then based on the result of that inspection, decide what to do next. So for example here, the student uh, might decide to, uh, she looks at her priors, she thinks it's worth the cost to see how much she likes college one. She pays the cost, she inspects it. Ooh, she discovers that she has value zero for college one, that's not very good. So she decides, let me now go and inspect college two. She inspects college two, she sees that she has value one, she thinks, great, I'm just going to go to college two and not bother with inspecting college three. Okay, so here's one example of a strategy that the student could use. And what we're trying to do is, yeah, solve this problem uh, adaptively, select a subset of colleges so that I'm maximizing my value. This is the best value that I've observed, minus the cost of every college that I've inspected. I have to pay the cost for every college I inspect, but I only get the value for my favorite one that I've inspected. And this single agent problem has a really nice solution. You can, uh, with a little misogyny, recast it as a multi-armed bandit problem from which it follows immediately that it has a Giddens index policy, uh, which is optimal. This was shown by Weizmann in 1979. The policy looks like this. First, for every college, I compute the uh, outside option value that makes me indifferent uh, between paying the cost to inspect the college or taking the outside option. What this is saying is that my expected marginal benefit from inspecting is the same as the cost. Okay. And then what I do, I compute one of these for every single college. I order them in order of these Giddens indices, and I inspect them in, in that order until one of my inspected values is bigger than all of the remaining uninspected indices. And then I just take that value. And the order is random, or? Uh, so the order is given by, uh, so I compute this index. This index is a deterministic number. Uh, and then the order is given by the decreasing values of the indices. But it, it, and it's the expected something, the expected yeah. value. So I'm expect, taking the expectation over my values. Uh, so this value is distributed according to the F. I mean, just the order. I was wondering whether there's some prior information that you use to establish so that you, if there's one college I don't like, then I know all the others I'm not going to like for sure because exante, I think they're worse. That's not at all what this is. Uh, no, so there's, there's no kind of restriction like that at all. In this model, your value for different colleges are drawn independently. Yes. So learning one doesn't tell me anything about. Anything. Yeah. So it's very. Cost and distribution. Yeah. That's just yes. a, so my values for all the different colleges are independently distributed. Um, I can pay my cost to learn the value at one college. This gives me no information on my values for other colleges. But it does affect whether I'm willing to then pay the cost to inspect other ones. Because if I observe a very high value, then I need to, if the value is higher than this, this index, for another college, then it's no longer worth it for me to inspect that other college. Does everyone understand the single agent problem? So maybe you should have asked this before, but sure. is the problem trivial if, if the students acquire the information in one shot? Why do you also impose this dynamics? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so our goal is to, to ask so the question was, you could think of a setting where students acquire all their information in one shot, and then we run the clearing house. Okay. And uh, Liad is asking, it seems like we're incorporating some kind of dynamic information acquisition. Why is this necessary? Uh, and so the idea is that in, 
in a, in a matching setting where we have the, these dynamics, it could be that after I learn part of my values, after I learn some information about my preferences, this can reduce the amount of learning that you have to do. And so we're, we're going to allow for these student, we're going to take these single agent problems and now allow them to be interleaved with each other. Say, okay, well, yeah, you go inspect college one. Okay, tell me what you, were, you found. Okay, now Nikhil, you go inspect college two. And we're going to see if by having all this additional power of having a dynamic mechanism where we interleave all these different inspections, we can reduce costs somehow. I think, I mean, it should be better motivation for this one, because the colleges, generally, the people are going, like, all admission. They get admission, they will go to all of them, they try all of them, and they decide. So can I assume, I mean, so, so great. So we are going to allow ourselves to have that full power of dynamic mechanisms. I agree it's not realistic in this setting to expect that we can do this. We're going to show a negative result that given particular restrictions and in the information that we can provide, even if we allow for this full dynamic interleaved inspection, we're not going to get to a good outcome. I still haven't defined the good outcome, but it's coming. But we'll show that if we use the right information, we can do something that looks a lot more like what the two of you are proposing, which is one round of the, uh, the central clearinghouse gives some information, kind of information, to all the students. They separately do their information acquisition based on that information, and we come back and get their preferences. So, so that's sort of what we're doing with this decentralized. We're giving ourselves the full power possible, but restrict in, in sort of the time dimension, but restricting what we can do in the information dimension and showing that that's not, that's not the right way to think about things. Okay. So maybe it will be clearer once I get through all of that part of the talk. Uh, so over here, the single agent would just inspect them until he finds one where what he sees is really better than what yes. he sees. Yes, yes, that's the structure of the single agent problem. And then he stops and he takes the one that he's seen which is better than which for which he would have non-negative expected uh, benefit from there on. And the V's is, are the same for you and your friends? Uh, the V is dependent on a, the V's are independent across agents and independent between. So what learning happens between the friends? So you said you go and visit that school and then you tell me, but I don't learn anything from that, right? Because well, I don't learn anything except, uh, so I don't learn anything about my preferences. Mm -hmm. well, I do learn something about which colleges I could be admitted to, right? If everyone wants to come to Berkeley, Berkeley's great. Then if I'm really low priority at Berkeley, then all of a sudden I think maybe I shouldn't pay the cost to figure out how much I like Berkeley. I was just going to ask, if it is one shot, I would have thought the computation problem is hard. If it is no index policy, if you have to reselect this set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Um, Let's, let's uh, talk about one shot versus dynamic offline. Okay. So just as a reminder, here is what we're allowing students to do. Uh, students can dynamically inspect colleges and, can, and decide to not inspect a college if the cost of doing so outweighs the marginal uh, benefits. This model does is it rationalizes some behaviors. So in the single agent setting, this is where students know the set of colleges that admit them. Students may optimally choose to remain partially informed. So in this example here, the student decided not to find out how much she liked college three because she didn't need that information. She already knew she wanted to go to college two. Or, or it was not worth the cost to her to find that information. On top of that, in the multi-agent setting, uh, what we're adding now is that every student's set of admitting colleges depends on other students' preferences. Okay. So I don't learn anything about your preference, uh, my preference from your preferences, but I do learn something about which school, which colleges would admit me and which colleges would not. Okay. And so in particular, let's say this student over here really wanted to go to college one. 
but based on all other students' preferences, she, she finds everyone else wants to go to college one as well, and she's, she doesn't have high enough priority to go. Then it's really not worth it to her to go and visit college one and, and verify that indeed, yes, I really like college one, because I mean, she can't go there. And so you, you might not want to inspect colleges that don't admit you. On top of that, let's say you're given multiple offers at once. Let's say we're in some kind of uh, uh, matching market where there are multiple rounds of offers of admission. Let's think, I don't know, PhD admissions. Sometimes there are some multiple rounds there. And so students may want to hold on to multiple offers and delay decision making until they have more information about what other students are doing. So let's say a PhD student here, here's this PhD student. Um, she has offers from uh, PhD programs two and three. Uh, but if we look at her optimal policy, she really wants to figure out how much she likes one first. In fact, it's, it's quite likely that she'll look at how much she likes one, discover she really likes it, and then just stop and go to one, if one is available to her. Okay, but she doesn't have an offer to one yet. She only has offers to two and three, but it's not worth it to her to decide which of the two that she prefers at this moment. She'd rather wait to see if she has a chance of getting into one. Okay, and so we're, we're gonna call this some kind of regret. If student one were forced to go and inspect and decide which of two or three she liked better, then she may regret having to go and acquire that information before knowing the set of colleges that admit her. Okay, so let me pull all those ideas together into our solution concepts, which we call regret-free stability. It's based on classical stability. So in classical stability, a pair, a student college pair, can block an outcome if the college is willing to defect. That is, uh, the student has higher priority than some student assigned to the college, or the college isn't full yet. And the student also is also willing to defect. This college is better, more preferred to the student than their current assignment. Okay, this is in a, in a setting where students know their preferences. And then outcome is stable if there are no blocking pairs. Let me just rewrite this a little bit. I'm gonna say a college is in a student's budget set if this, this condition we had before holds. This is just saying that I look at all the students who are currently assigned to that college who have higher rank than me, higher priority than me. There's not enough of those kinds of students to fill the college. Therefore, I can still go to that college. And I block if I also then prefer going to that college over my current assignment. Okay, so this is just stability in a complete information setting. What I'm gonna do is now define a notion of stability in our uh, incomplete information setting. We say a college and student block an outcome. Now an outcome consists of both a matching and a current information state. And again, the pair blocks if the college is in the student's budget set. This is, this, this is it's not full yet of students that it prefers to the student. And the student either inspected the college and prefers it to their current assignment, or has not inspected it yet, but is willing to pay the cost to do so. Okay, so this outcome is not stable because the, the student, can, there's still more the student can do. She can go and inspect the college. So you're running deferred acceptance after every new inspection, basically. I, I don't know if it's helpful to think of it that way. Uh, just think of it as I, I drop you on an outcome and some amount of inspected inspection. And you look at whether everyone's happy with the outcome given the current inspections. You're not telling us how you do it, but you're defining what's good. Yes. So this is just a solution concept. I'm not telling you how we got there. Uh, and, and in some ways, it's similar to how we define stability. I'm just I'm dropping you somewhere and asking if it satisfies certain conditions where nobody is going to deviate. So this, uh, is this also ruling our behavior of how we do optimal search? Or will there be a game on top of this and this is supposed to be something yeah. else? Great question. Okay. So, <laughs> so in stability, what I'm doing is I drop you at an outcome, an information, and I say, uh, given this outcome, I don't want to defect to another school, and I don't want to gather extra information. Okay. On top of that, we're also going to impose 
that I gathered the right amount of information. So here's where I'm going to impose sort of this, this notion of optimal information acquisition. So we say an outcome is regretfully stable if the matching is stable with respect to the inquired information and the inspections are optimal with respect to the matching. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, here's the outcome. I have a matching. I have a certain amount of information that was gathered in order to get to this matching. And what is this information? I'm saying this information should be the same as if I gave every student their budget set from the matching and said, here's exactly your budget set. Here's the set of colleges you could conceivably block with. Those are the colleges you can go to. Now go do your optimal inspection on that set. Why is that not already captured by the uh -huh. Why next to it's so greedy? Yeah. And so what, what it's doing is it's saying that not only is the outcome is, not only ha do I not want to inspect more, I haven't inspected too much in order to get to this outcome. Okay. In other words, I'm trying to capture a particular kind of regret. So you, you might think of one kind of regret, which is due to uncertainty about your own preferences. Okay, you had a good prior for a college, you pay a cost to inspect, and you realize a low value, maybe you regret that. You're like, oh, I shouldn't have gone and inspected that bad college. But there's no way you could have known that, right, based on your priors. Okay, but what I am ruling out with this solution concept is I'm ruling out regret due to uncertainty about the market. So in particular, once all of the, I'm in this continuum economy, right? So once everyone else has sort of realized what they're going to do, I know exactly the set of colleges that are in my budget set or that are available to me. And so I don't want to inspect one that's not available to me. That's a wasted cost. I'm also going to, um, in that set, I now have this sort of optimal inspection order where I want to make sure that I'm uh, inspecting in the right order, and I also want to make sure that I'm not over-inspecting. So once, once I have a really good college, I stop inspecting. Yes? So is, this, is it like a refinement? So otherwise, you would get stable outcomes where everyone inspects everything? Uh, yeah, so this is a refinement of stability. So he here's a concept of stability that's, so our concept of stability here, this is fine. This is, this is a definition of stability in the setting and we're refining to sort of be more precise about what we mean by w what is optimal information acquisition, what is the least cost that we have to pay in order to get to a stable outcome, and which stable outcomes are consistent with this least cost. So <clears throat> can you talk about the efficiency properties of a regret-free stable outcome? Yeah. Because, because I might have acquired an optimal for me amount of information, it might not have been the socially optimal information because, yeah. as you said, my information acquisition affects yeah. how much yeah. you want to do. Yeah, so it's not necessary. we're not saying anything about utilitarian welfare, we're not summing up over different students. We're, we're just, and part of why we chose to do that is we didn't want to compare these utilities and costs between different students, uh, but we're just saying that given what everyone else has done, you've done the optimal thing for you. So. But everyone doing an optimal thing for them might be very far away in this world. So typically stability kind of has some yeah. Yeah, so the, yes, yes. So there is a gap between this outcome and you know, efficiency. Yes, if you were to define efficiency in terms of utilitarian social welfare, where you sum up over everyone their value at cost, it, it could be quite far. So we're not making any claims about that kind of efficiency. Um, so the guys who are the schools I inspected and the values I saw, or just the schools I inspected? Yes. No, so, is it like both or only... Wait, can you repeat the question? So is, it, is the guy the schools I inspected, or both the schools I inspected and the values that I saw? Oh, oh yeah. So, the chi is uh, the schools I inspected and the values that I saw. Yeah. I mean, the chi is the schools I inspected, and the values that I saw are primitive of the economy. And so, I, those values are now the values are deterministic, they're realized at the beginning of time. So when, in the, in the next slide, when you say that this, my information acquisition has to be optimal given my budget set, is this, does it take into account that maybe I inspected something that I shouldn't have because it was valid? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that there is some inspection 
in this outcome. I'm going to ignore it. Okay, I'm going to see what I would have done if all I knew was my budget set. And I'm going to compare which colleges I inspected under this policy versus the colleges I actually inspected. And I want them to be the same. Okay, so, so that condition is more on the indicator, not on the realized language. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great. So this is our solution concept. And uh, one question you might have at this stage about the solution concept is, well, this seems like a very strong solution concept, right? Essentially what I'm requiring is that every student uh, has full market information before they do anything. They know everything about, that they need to know about everyone else's preferences before they make their own inspections. Is, does this thing even exist? It seems very strong. Okay. And uh, what we show is, uh, yes, it exists. Um, we, in fact, we can show that not only does it exist, a set of regret-free stable outcomes forms a non-empty lattice. Uh, and this lattice is ordered in terms of the, uh, how, how much the students value their matchings. And we also have some conditions for uniqueness. And so how we show this is we actually show that on top of existence, this set of uh, outcomes has a very nice structure. They, have, they can be characterized by market clearing cutoffs. Okay, so what I do is uh, I introduce a cutoff. Okay, and I say a student has a college in her budget set if and only if her priority is above that cutoff. Okay. And if her priority is above that cutoff, then uh, she looks at the set of colleges where her priority is above the cutoff. She performs her optimal inspection on that set, and this induces some demand. And this induces some aggregate demand when I sum over all, all students. And I want this demand to be market clearing. So it exactly uh, matches the quota of all of the colleges. So this is just saying this is some complicated um, object that I defined uh, where it, it's not clear how to reach it algorithmically. I just sort of dropped you on this object and it satisfies some properties. But in fact, here's a way that we can characterize it using a small number of uh, uh, cutoffs, one for each college. Okay. Any questions so far? So let me skip why we can do this cut of structure. It's essentially a reduction, uh, a pretty nice reduction from this incomplete information setting to uh, we can show it's equivalent to an economy in the complete information setting. And then we can just port over all the results from complete, all like the structural results from the complete information to incomplete information. Uh, for the particular cutoff uh, structure, all we need is that student preferences satisfy the weak axiom of real, reveal preferences. Okay, so I've done a bunch of things. I've introduced you to a model with matching with one-sided costly information acquisition. I've spent some time setting up this solution concept, which we call regret-free stability. Uh, it consists of two parts, a matching as well as acquired information, and we're requiring that the matching is stable with respect to the acquired information, and the acquired information is optimal with respect to the matching. These are the parts of the solution concept. And so now we can come to the question of, well, market design. What, what should a market looks like, look like if this is the solution concept that we want to reach? We design clearinghouses that facilitate efficient information acquisition. And, and, and uh, this particular definition of efficiency, where we're not asking students to over-inspect, given their options, but also resulting in these stable outcomes. I'm going to show you two main kinds of results. First is that s standard matching mechanisms kind of can't do this. And the problem is that they, they don't have enough information. They don't get enough information from the students. And so they result in this deadlock where I need to know your preferences to determine my preferences optimally. And you need to know my, my preferences to determine your preferences optimally. So how we can get around this is we can use the cutoff characterization. and. If we can learn enough information about the cutoffs, then we can get to an approximately optimal outcome. Okay. So the 
question is, how can markets guide information acquisition? Uh, one possible solution is to allow for these a sort of dynamic sequential uh, c communication where the clearinghouse aggregates and communicates pr preference information as it's acquired. So I, I get information about uh, Liat's preferences and tell them to everyone so then, so then you have more information about where you might be able to go. And so we define these things called communication processes. You don't have to think about them too much other than the fact that it's basically we communicate information from the clearinghouse to the student. The student takes the information along with their private information about their type to do kind of some kind of inspection and reports the inspection result back to the clearinghouse. And we can kind of do this in as many rounds as we like and interleave the students however we like. Okay, this is just some kind of communication process between the centralized clearinghouse and the students. And we say that such a process is succinct if at the beginning, when students have only information about their initial types, all they can report is their inspection indices. So this is the order in which I'd like to inspect the colleges. Here are my costs and here are my priorities. Okay. Let's say we restrict ourselves to this class of mechanisms. Sorry, what is R? Uh, R is just the ranks, the priorities. Here's our main result. Let's say we have a succinct mechanism of that sort. Then there exists an economy where the outcome of this mechanism is not regretfully stable. Okay, and what does this economy look like? It looks so, something like this. Here's an economy where there are um, three students, three colleges. Each college has two spots. Uh, student one really wants to inspect college one first and probably wants to go to college one. Uh, but she has top priority at colleges two and three. And I set this up cyclically so that student two has top priority at two, but wants, uh, has top priority at one and three, but wants to inspect two first. And three has top priority at one and two, but wants to inspect three first. Okay, so in this setting, let's say I try to use some mechanism like college performing deferred acceptance. Okay, this is a succinct mechanism. It doesn't really use any information from the students. It just looks at the priorities and says, okay, you're top ranked at college two. You can go there if you want. But what goes wrong with this mechanism is that, well, student one really doesn't want to figure out which of two or three she wants to go to until she knows whether she can go to college one. And the same is true for all three students. And so if we force any of them to make a move to inspect, then they're going to be doing something suboptimal. Or in other words, they're going to be paying the cost to learn the market clearing cutoffs instead of just paying the cost to learn their own preferences. One moment. Yeah. So, so the general theorem is we take sort of a gadget of this sort, we insert it into a larger economy just to make sure that like, we, we, we have like more seats than students, we insert some extra students, make sure that there's only certain things that can happen with stability, but that's essentially what's going on, that we have this cycle of students whose preference, optimal preference acquisition problems all depend on each other. And so a student must make an inspection first, and that is going to result in some kind of regret. And so what we're saying is that in economies with these kinds of dependencies, learning the market clearing cutoffs is more costly than just having students learn their individual preferences for making them do extra work. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, and then in discrete economies, so this is true even in a continuum economy in the set setting that we're in, but I've shown you this discrete example because it really just makes it obvious what's going on. Okay, and so one question you might have now is, okay, you define this this solution concept, it seems strong. It is strong in that we can't get to it using things like deferred acceptance or succinct mechanisms in general. What should we do? And so what we can do is the problem is not the solution concept. The problem is that we don't have enough information at the beginning if we're restricting ourselves to these kinds of communication processes. And so we say, let's take a communication process with an oracle. We're gonna give it some additional information at the beginning. What traditional information should we give it? 
in order to, to make this work. And so uh, kind of a cheat is we can say, well, we can characterize regret-free stable outcomes in terms of these market clearing cutoffs. If we knew the market clearing cutoffs, we could just tell them to the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse posts these cutoffs. They say, if you're above the cutoff, then you can consider this college. And then this effectively decentralizes the information acquisition problems for every student. And they can just go do their own individual optimal search on their budget set. And we'll get some kind of outcome. Okay? And actually, in, in this, if it's exactly the market clearing cutoffs, then we'll get exactly a regret-free stable outcome. On top of that, what we can do is let's say we have, uh, we don't know the market clearing cutoffs exactly, but we have historical data. Okay? So we know last year's cutoffs, and we know that last year's economy is kind of similar to this year's economy. Okay? They're drawn from the same distribution. Then what we can say is that we can post last year's cutoffs, have students act according to those, and this will give me a regret-free stable matching or outcome for slightly perturbed capacities. Or in other words, if I'm willing to use, uh, to, to be a little flexible on my capacities, then I can actually entirely remove the problem of finding or paying the cost to find the market clearing cutoffs, and I can have each student just pay the cost for their individual information acquisition. Okay. And so what does this mean for market design? Well. Mechanisms like deferred acceptance, where we don't really tell students much, can incur pretty large regret if students don't know these cutoffs, so they don't have enough information about aggregate demand to know which colleges are available to them. But they could be doing pretty well if students do have access to this information. For example, if this is a marketplace that happens year after year, and there are cutoffs, and you can go look them up. Okay, and so we even have a convergence theorem that sort of says how close can, do these uh, capacities need to be. Uh, we also show that if historical data is not available, you can use some kind of free information that's available from the college priorities to bootstrap this process. Um, and here's like one way you can do that. Um, and we also have some convergence theorems there. But in conclusion, let me wrap up. Uh, what we've done is we've presented a tractable matching model with costly information acquisition and show, uh, introduced these uh, the solution concept, this regret-free stable outcome, which is stable in this incomplete information setting and also making sure that students are not paying too much cost to get to the outcome. We've shown these outcomes exist. They have a nice cutoff structure as well as a lattice structure. But the broader question is, uh, what is the role of the marketplace in guiding information acquisition and getting us to this solution concept or other solution concepts in general? We show that existing mechanisms can lead to informational deadlock and incentives to delay information acquisition. And the reason is that students need this market information, this aggregate information, to efficiently acquire their own information. So what this means for market design is, well, maybe instead of thinking so much about what mechanism we're using, we should think more about what information we're providing. Okay. So in, in this particular setting, all we had to do is know the market clearing cutoffs, provide those to the students, and whether we had a good mechanism or not for the actual assignment process, the, the students should be doing pretty well. Um, yes, I guess that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I have time for more questions. So, you publish this clearinghouse, which is information about every college tells you you can see where you're ranked there. Right. And then you start inspecting, and yeah. what happens next? I mean, you, yeah, so, you apply to one after the other. I mean, yeah, so, so, so in this setting then, or, or this, this cutoff mechanism, we post the cutoffs, you do your inspections, and then you, you basically only apply in this, in this particular mechanism. You only apply to your favorite college out of the ones you inspected, which you know you can get to. Okay. Of course, in real markets, things look a little different to this. That's because in real markets, the, the setup is also a little different to our setup. So there are additional factors. Maybe you don't exactly know your priorities, uh, or maybe you don't exactly know the cutoffs. And 
Yeah, so then in those kinds of settings, you'll have to tweak this. Um, I'm just curious because it's sort of like what you described is similar to what is kind of available right now in terms of uh, sort of emission statistics. And, uh, mm -hmm. But now there's sort of this trend from moving towards holistic review and um, on the, the spirit of AI and uh, parametric stuff, uh, would it be possible to you know, create some sort of profile and then have some program um, give a student uh, some sort of estimate of their likelihood of being admitted to a certain college based on the profile of the current student body? Uh, and then you can decide sort of, you know, am I willing to pay the application fee of this much if my estimate likelihood of this? Yeah, so um, I should clarify that in uh, when we talk about college admissions, we were thinking a little about college admissions outside the US, so in, in many countries where it is just based on an admissions score. You, you take some exams, you take the weighted sum of different exams, and that tells you your rank, oh, your relative rank, at how likely you are to get into different colleges. So I think what you're proposing is maybe in systems like the US or in Canada where it's not so clear how to calculate your, your score, it, it might be useful to build a tool that would be able to predict this for you. And I really think that's, I think that's true. And there are also a lot of informational interventions already in place that sort of help, help, help students uh, determine exactly this information. Which colleges do I actually have some probability of getting into? Yeah. So I think there's scope for that. Uh, but uh, I, I think in most things with like personalized predictions and assignment problems, there, there needs to be care taken in how this is done. So like uh, related to that, I guess um, one thing that Eduardo Pensilvedo said when I gave this talk was uh, it suggests that it would be a good idea for school districts to tell people their lottery numbers before they start thinking about what schools to go to. Yeah. And uh, at least as far as I know, uh, that doesn't really happen. And I wonder if that is that psychological or like how could that be bad? Like, why don't school districts tell parents what their lottery numbers are for their kids. Like, why don't they flip the coins before the parents write down their preference lists? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I am. <laughs> yeah. Could we enforce, I mean, maybe for lottery numbers not so much, but for, for the college admissions, it could create very homogeneous student bodies. Because people may not apply anymore to a school that they think only 10% of people like them are at that school, and then they stop applying, and then it's only 5%, and it's self-reinforcing. I think that's a little different to what Nicole was proposing. Uh, which yeah, is? Yeah, not for the I'm saying oh. for the uh, okay. No, I was busy. Um, yeah, so being able to um, characterize using cutoffs is really using that we know one side's preferences fully. But if we wanted to just go to one step back, just the definition of stability, I think if you were to have uh, two sided incomplete information where the, the uh, uh, the structure of information acquisition is the same on both sides. You may still be able to. Yeah, so vaguely I had in mind when listening to your talk, I was entertaining the idea that maybe if you have like a continue both sides, and maybe there's no target answer to about the other side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that I think would be possible then to even do some kind of some kind of cutoffs where, where you have probability of being above the I was wondering whether the uh, regret free stability concept if it introduces any kind of compatibility problems like with the student or the type or something. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. What about incentives? Uh, we have completely abstracted away from incentives in this talk because we were basically saying, let's say we give the mechanism full power, what can it do? Uh, definitely agree that regret free stability is not going to be incentive compatible. Um, well. I guess in this large market, it is incentive compatible because you, as one person, cannot affect uh, your budget set. But if, um, yeah, yeah, if we were in, in a discrete setting, then I don't think it's incentive compatible. We wouldn't. It's 
Yeah. I don't even know what to, how to define incentive compatibility because we need like a game with an action space. So. It should be fine in a large market. Yeah, it's fine in a large market. I think in some sense, the idea of incentive is actually kind of plays a big role in this sort of scenario beyond the scope of maybe that's still relevant in the sense that um, people do start to try to adapt their profiles to fit what they think certain colleges are looking for, and they assess you know what colleges they care about based on how many other people apply there. And so there's sort of this circular, you know, a lot of people talk about this, uh, especially in the public press, that you know, what makes a good college? A lot of people want to get go there, but they can't get in. Uh, so then they have to try to do things that other people who can get in do, and then that changes sort of the profile of, of the applicants as well as the... Yeah. Like everybody's trying to get higher SAT school. Right, yeah. And then everyone's trying to play violin and do a bunch of sports. <laughs> <laughs> <It's well known. laughs> there are a lot of interesting questions we can ask once we start letting people develop their preferences in different ways. Maybe we can stop here and take the discussion. Yes, thank you.